quick things about uh, Sephora's contribution. Um, she is currently the International Program Director at Stand Earth, uh, the chair of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative, which I know some other folks here have been uh, engaged with. She is the co-founder of the Global Gas and Oil Network, the former co-director of Greenpeace International's Climate and Energy Program, and the co-founder of Forest Ethics, um, which is, is now evolved into Stand Earth. She has also held uh, positions advising the British Columbia government on climate policy, uh, was appointed to the Alberta government to co-chair the Oil Sands Advisory Working Group tasked with making recommendations to implement climate change and cumulative impact policies in the oil sands. Um, she is the author of Crazy Time, Living Our Environmental Challenge, uh, and is listed as one of the 35 most influential women in British Columbia. Um, the list goes on. Um, she also has an honorary doctorate from the University of British Columbia, recognizing her various contributions. Uh, so it is my great uh, pleasure to introduce Sephora um, over to you. And then once uh, Sephora is finished, we will have time for some Q&A. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. You can. Yes. Can the people in the room hear me as well? Yes. Oh, great. Okay, just checking. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction. We were all a bit younger in Clackwood Sound. Um, and, and at least that memory was a little bit better than, than the last speech I gave. Um, a person came up to me who um, uh, was is a professor at Oxford and and uh, they're doing their doctorate and and said how much he was inspired by those blockades and he always wished he could have gone gone and I stupidly said well why didn't you come <laughs> he said because I was a toddler <laughs> right time marches on. So uh, I would like to begin uh, by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the unceded and traditional territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, the Musqueam, and the Squamish uh, First Peoples, First Nations, and I'm, I'm grateful to be able to live and work here, and I'm committed to supporting their vision and work for truth, reconciliation, and land back. I want to start today by taking a quick flyby of where we are as a global community in fighting climate change and building the new systems that we need to limit warming uh, to the goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius, I think there is a lot of good news. There's some really, really bad news. And I think some surprising considerations uh, about the assumptions that underlie climate policy today and agreements on climate change that I would like to challenge. So first, uh, let me let me start with the good news. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to need someone to tell me that that's working as well. Perfect. Yeah, as we are seeing. Can you see one one slide there that says fossil fuel tree? It looks great. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. So just see if I can forward that. There we go. Given the headlines, you might expect coal and gas to be booming right now. I, I mean, the first bombs hadn't even fallen uh, from Putin's war on Ukraine before the oil and gas industry was screaming for more fossil fuel approvals and production to address energy security. And certainly despite the climate crisis and much evidence that fossil fuel build out takes longer, it's more dangerous and more expensive than renewables, some countries, including my own, have been using that argument to justify expansion. However, the good news is that renewables met all of the world's growth in electricity this year, stopping any rise in fossil generation. Wind and solar filled three quarters of new demand, while hydro met the rest. In China, wind and solar met an astonishing 92% of all new demand for electricity. And of course, that's only electricity, it's not transport, where we of course see um, a huge challenge. But 
Rystad Energy just ran the most recent CapEx numbers and found that global investment in wind and solar leapt upwards in 2022. And for the first time, investment in rooftop solar, utility scale solar and wind were bigger than investments in oil and gas. In some places, the payback time for renewable projects is now less than one year. As Russia strangles gas supplies to European homes, countries are turning in earnest to electrify heating with heat pumps. In Finland, four out of 10 homes already use heat pumps and sales jumped 80% this year alone. In August, just one month, 148,000 Germans applied for heat pump programs. The trends are good. One recent study showed that renewable investments in Germany and, and France sealed returns for of 178% over a five-year period, compared with a minus 20% return for fossil fuel investments. And meanwhile, renewable energy and battery prices are still plummeting, now cheaper than fossil fuels. Fossil fuel divestment has skyrocketed, now representing more than 40 trillion in committed assets. And the cost of capital for fossil fuels has doubled in the last decade while it's dropped for renewables. We have seen some really dramatic policy shifts with over 50 countries and regions planning to ban fossil fuel cars. In 2017, 6% of the world's GDP had set net zero targets. Today, 90%. The share of emissions covered by a carbon tax has increased fourfold in a decade to nearly a quarter. So there are many reasons to be optimistic about the future and our ability to fast track electrification, efficiency and renewable energy deployment at scale. However, and I think you knew this was coming, the hard truth is that since pre-industrial times, human activity has caused approximately 1.1 degree of, of global warming. At current warming rate, 1.5 degrees Celsius will be reached by 2040 or possibly sooner. We know that a stable climate is somewhere around 350 parts per million. Today, we've reached about 421 parts per million of carbon trapped in our atmosphere and creating a blanket smothering the earth. And daily CO2 emissions are rising. In the first eight months of 2022, we, admit, we emitted on average 98.97 metric tons of carbon dioxide a day. This, growth, this graph shows us the rise of about 2.2% in 2021 alone. So what are we doing about it? What's actually happening? We know what's causing it. And many years ago, the world came together to commit to acting with urgency to put in place the policies and finance to mitigate climate change to drastically cut GHG emissions to give the next generation a fighting chance. So how are we doing? The cold hard, hard truth is that we have yet to bend the emissions curve. We know that we need to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2030 from 2010 levels to keep warming to, more, to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. But if we add up the commitments based on available national action plans, we see a projected increase of greenhouse gas emissions between now and 2030 by 14%. This chart shows, first of all, on the bottom where emissions have to be if we want to constrain warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. It tells us that emissions continue to go up and the policies and actions that have been put in place to put us on track to about, put us on track to about 2.9 degrees. Pledges and targets, maybe 2.1 degrees Celsius. So what does a two degree world look like? And what does that 
actually mean? One of the best and most concise explanations I've ever read comes from David Wallace Wells in The Uninhabitable Earth. As temperature rise, this could mean many of the biggest cities in the Middle East and South Asia will become lethally hot in summer, perhaps as soon as 2050. There will be ice-free summers in the Arctic and the unstoppable disintegration of the West Antarctic's ice sheet, which some scientists believe has already begun, threatening the world's coastal cities with inundation. Coral reefs would mostly disappear. There would be tens of millions of climate refugees, perhaps many more, fleeing droughts, flooding, and extreme heat, and the possibility of multiple climate-driven natural disasters striking simultaneously. And of course, we know that today, coral reefs are already disappearing. We know that our oceans are about 30% more acidic, just with the warming of 1.1 degrees. So all that at two degrees and we are currently on track for about three degrees. And we know from living this average one degree rise right now that the only thing wrong with a lot of the scientists projections of what we would experience is that they've been too conservative. To be clear, no one was predicting lethal heat domes in Canada in 2021. Today, as I speak to you from Vancouver, it's with relief that we just got our first little bit of rain. The whole lower mainland, Vancouver Island, and many other parts of the province are in a level five se severe drought in October. We'll be, le we'll be learning of and seeing the impacts of this for months, but recent photos from Indigenous guardians on just one river in BC show an estimated flooding of 65,000 salmon deaths in one, in one river. Of course, many other parts of the world are experiencing even greater impacts this year. This year, we've witnessed unprecedented heat waves sweeping the planet, breaking records day after day. Birds literally falling from the sky in India, but also in California and Britain. Lakes and rivers shriveled to all time lows. In the US, scientists spread about the mega drought that was the worst in 1,200 years, commented that he and other scientists can no longer use the term drought and are now using a different term, aridification. In Europe, the shriveling lakes and waterways revealed Roman ruins and ghost villages. The most ominous are the hunger stones, engraved with warnings to future generations. One stone was carved in the Middle Ages and re-engraved in 1616 with these words, if you see me, weep. The heat waves have crippled food production and many are indeed weeping most acutely because of the thousands of people from Europe to India to China who have died in this year's heat waves, but also because of the millions more who are now struggling to have access to water or feed their families. Southern China has arguably been hit the hardest by what is possibly the most vicious heat wave in human history, lasting over three months. China's biggest lake shrunk to just one quarter of its usual size and several regions launched weather modification operations, firing missiles armed with silver iodide into the sky in an attempt to seed clouds and cause rain. And then there's the fires. In California, families this summer in their cars trying to outrun the fires. I'll never forget those images on the news. And then two billion animals incinerated in Australia, millions of hectares of forest lost, including record loss in the Amazon rainforest, the wettest forests on earth. And the floods. A third of the entire country of Pakistan is now underwater, an area larger than Britain. 1.7 million homes, 246 bridges, 6,500 kilometers of roads, more than 800,000 hectares of swamped farmland, 
33 million people have been displaced by this flooding, 1,700 immediate deaths. But now we are in the wave of new deaths from the malaria and dengue fever as a result of living with flooding. Hospitals are crowded with desperate parents of children who are collapsing from fever due to waterborne illnesses across the country. Experts predict a third wave as the country is now facing widespread famine. It's worth noting here as we talk about policy that Pakistan estimates it will need 30 billion to address the damage of the flood. A UN aid program is offering 600 million. And even most of that has not started moving. This should not, however, be about aid. We urgently need new funds set up beyond what is being negotiated for loss and damage at COP27 to emer for emergency relief, paid by those of us who have caused this, because that's the bottom line. It's not aid if we did the damage. And make no mistake, Pakistan is not responsible for the emissions trapped in our atmosphere today that have caused these floods. Developing countries are not asking for charity in the loss and damage negotiations or in calling for a new rapid response fund. They're calling for reparations for wealthy countries who caused the majority of the emissions trapped in our atmosphere to pay for the damage that we have caused. So why, given the dropping price of renewables, the massive uptake in climate policies to reduce demand for oil and gas, why are we facing such a nightmare that is only projected to get worse? Where have we gone wrong and what's holding us back? Today, I'd like to highlight three critical issues that I believe are holding us back. First of all, the production gap. I'm sure you're all very familiar with the idea of the emissions gaps, but we now know from the UN production gap report that we have a serious production gap. We are currently on track to produce 110% more fossil fuels than the world can ever burn, or it will burn us. Secondly, I want to dig into some of the modeling assumptions that are guiding policymaking and holding back ambition. And finally, the power and political influence of the oil industry. So let's get back to basics. Climate policy and international agreements are complicated, but what's not complicated is that 86% of the emissions trapped in our atmosphere and causing climate change come from three products, oil, gas, and coal. For decades, we've been um, negotiating emissions reduction targets and putting policies in place to reduce emissions and the demand for these products. But unlike every other intransigent problem of social good, we've been trying to cut with only one half of the scissors, the demand side. Cutting with both sides of the scissors would require that we also put in place supply side and production side policies to ban or manage a ramp down of the products that threaten the social good. Think CFCs or asbestos or tobacco. When you really start thinking about it, it's fascinating that the emphasis in climate policy has solely been put on the consumer and not on the producer. Of course, if you look at the research from people like Naomi Oreski, you find that that's been the plan of the fossil fuel companies for decades. Focus on the problem, on the consumer. The companies, well, they're just meeting demand. It's very telling that even the concept of carbon footprint was, was uh, of individual carbon footprint was actually developed and promoted first by BP. What we now know from the research, the new climate lawsuits, is that the oil and gas and coal companies knew decades ago their products had a, the impact their products had on human health and our climate. They buried the research, they funded doubt and denial and have been remarkably successful in keeping the need to regulate the supply of their products completely out of policy and climate negotiations. I will never forget the day that I searched the Paris Agreement 
looking for the words oil, gas, coal, or fossil fuels, none of them appear, not even once, in the world's main climate agreement. The fossil fuel industry has been successful in making itself invisible. Look, I spent years meeting with the CEOs of several major oil companies. As it was mentioned in my introduction, I also worked for several years appointed by the Alberta government to, to co-chair the Oil Sands Advisory Working Group and develop consensus-based recommendations on applying climate policy to the oil sands. And I did this work in part because I believe that there are good people everywhere, good people who are stuck in bad systems. I wanted to understand what these CEOs were seeing when they read the science how they could justify expanding oil and gas production at this moment in history. And what I found is that they know. They know that production will have to wind down, but they're all holding out hope that they'll be the last barrel standing or that technologies like carbon capture and storage, which are not working at scale or cost competitive will somehow allow them to continue to expand production. They also plan for massive offsets to allow them to continue to expand production. But the problem is, the math just doesn't add up. Today, as I mentioned, we're on track to produce 110% more fossil fuels in the next decade than the world can ever burn and stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius. In fact, even if coal was phased out overnight, existing oil and gas projects alone would push us above 1.5 degrees Celsius. We've known this for some time. We've been hearing since I think 2014 when Christopher McGlade and Paul Eakins published their first paper in Nature that we need to keep the majority of the fossil fuel reserves in the ground if we're going to maintain a stable climate. But for decades, climate policy has been designed on a theory that we can reduce demand for fossil fuels and increase the price of carbon. And the market, turbocharged by alternatives such as wind and solar that are now cheaper than fossil fuels, well, the market will constrain supply. But the problem is that's not happening, not fast enough to keep us safe. Why? In part because of tax breaks and fossil fuel subsidies are distorting the markets, and because of the power and influence of the fossil fuel industry, who no longer deny climate change, but have now moved from denial to delusion. They can keep expanding the problem and count on technologies that are not yet working at scale or cost competitive to fix the problem in the future. It's clear in the production gap report that the world will need to decrease coal production annually by about 11% between 2020 and 2030. Oil and gas production would have to decrease 4% and 3% respectively every year. Over the last couple of years, we've thankfully seen a number of reports and statements that confirm these findings. The IEA 1.5 degree scenario that noted that there's no need for investment in fossil fuel supply in a net zero pathway. The United Nations Secretary General on the release of the last IPCC report, this report should sound a death knell for coal and fossil fuels before they destroy our planet. He further, no he further noted that there's no, oh, sorry, that investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure is moral and economic madness. Yet today, the top 20 oil and gas companies currently have $930 billion of new oil and gas investment planned between now and 2030. My own country just approved a large offshore oil drilling project called the Bay de Nord. Prime Minister Trudeau, who considers himself a climate leader and has put in place some very significant climate policies, said at the time this project will help us meet are at net zero goals. This fallacy is perpetuated by the fossil fuel companies in their own scenarios. Here on the slide, you see the trajectory necessary 
for meeting Paris goals, both a likely chance of two degrees and a medium chance of 1.5 degrees in the blue and red at the bottom. The squiggly lines in the top are all show you Shell and BP and Exxon scenarios and plans, all dramatically increasing production, but maintaining to have net zero goals. We're not regulating production. That's the bottom line. And I hope the one of the critical takeaways for those of you who are policymakers, certainly there's no international cooperation to regulate production. And many countries still believe that their only job is emissions, is emissions reductions. So you have Canada, the UK, the US, Norway, Australia, all claiming climate leadership while growing production, despite the clear science that we need to stop expansion and wind down immediately. It's not a transition if we're continuing to grow the problem. That's an absurd fa fallacy that we've strangely accepted because as I heard our minister say the other day, the system's been designed so countries are only responsible for their emissions and we don't double count. To that, I can really only reply, how's that working so far? What would happen if we double count? We make the transition to cleaner and safer energy systems quicker or at all. Given that fossil fuels today are the greatest cause of premature death globally, just from air pollution, not even from the climate impacts, one in five people die or 8 million people a year just from the air pollution from fossil fuels. Would a faster transition be such a bad thing? So the second reason only focusing on demand policy doesn't work is that no matter how high the carbon price or how low the cost of renewables, the markets can't regulate production because it is so distorted by fossil fuel subsidies. It's not just the companies who are trying to be the last barrel sold, it's also the countries. Last year, the IMF reported the fossil fuel industry is getting $5.9 trillion in subsidies a year, or $11 million a minute. Last month, the IEA and the OECD reported that in the last year, the fossil fuel subsidies have gone up by 51% in wealthy countries. This is the last gasp of the fossil fuel industry. And rather than allowing them to price out and decline, our governments are propping them up, extending their life and locking in expensive fossil fuel infrastructure and future emissions. I think the root of the problem is in part the assumptions we have been baking into climate models for decades that have normalized fossil fuel growth and relied heavily on technological fixes and carbon pricing while avoiding actually designing policy to regulate the problem. So climate models are simply stories. They're stories that we tell ourselves, stories that help guide decision-making I sat down recently with a number of scientists from the IPCC people who had contributed to the IPCC models over many, many years, because I wanted to understand how the models addressed fossil fuels and supply side issues better. And honestly, what I heard shocked me. I've tried to summarize it here for you for the first time. The scientists told me that in current global mitigation science, as decided by, as de defined by the IPCC's Working Group 3 6 assessment report in Chapter 3, for those of you who are policy wonks who are following this, which is used by countries to define targets and net zero plans, it was considered unrealistic to model stopping expansion of fossil fuels let alone the reduction of oil, gas, and coal production. So instead, the models rely on global net negative emissions through massive deployment of carbon dioxide removal. This radically downplays the scale of the challenge and the urgency of mitigation. I found out that the IPCC's IAM scenarios, carbon dioxide removal is dominated by bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or BECs, 
considered the most effective negative emissions technology, with the next most significant option to be direct air carbon capture and storage, contributing typically only about one-tenth of BECs for Paris compliance scenarios. So the median CO2 removal by BECs in those scenarios is 12 gigatons of carbon per year, about one third of current fossil fuel emissions. Total CCS, which includes BECs, stacks, and CCS in combination with fossil fuel burning amounts to 665 billion tons of CO2 until 2100 in Paris compliance scenarios. Half of that is accounted for by BECs. So 330 billion through BECs. What does that actually mean? For comparison, about 0.2 billion tons of CO2 were captured by CCS between 1996 and 2020. So at that rate, it will take 79,800 years to capture the CO2 needed to comply with the Paris Agreement. The other thing that I found quite horrific is there are no BECS schemes in operation today. So if we were to do BECS globally at the scale modeled by the IAM, the Integrated Assessment Modeling Scenarios, that would require removal of about 25 to 80% of the current cropland area or an area approximately twice the size of India. So for those of you new to this, like I was, what that actually means is that we would need to plant crops on an area twice the size of India every year and harvest those crops, burn that carbon and store it every year. And how much of this are we doing right now? None. If BEX is established on forest land, instead it requires first clearing the forest, which creates a carbon debt that will, that will take many decades to be paid back, making forest-based BEX unsuitable for the type of mitigation required to meet the Paris Agreement. There is a growing use of tree biomass for energy production and plans to expand schemes into BEX. Therefore, even the prospect of BEX is likely doing countless demand to intact forest ecosystems. At Stand.Earth, we actually put drones up above the DRAX facilities in BC to see if they were truly only using wood waste. We not only found whole trees going into making wood pellets that are supposedly an ecological response to shutting down coal, but we found when we traced it that some of those whole trees were coming from old growth forest areas in British Columbia. The commercial viability of this practice depends on a taxpayer subsidies, as well as an accounting loophole by the IPCC that classifies biomass energy as carbon neutral, while the emissions from clearing the forest and from the biomass operations are being accounted for elsewhere. So yes, of course, we need to plant more trees and protect forests and wetlands, but not to justify more pollution. Let's not forget that the world's largest forest, the boreal and the Amazon, are no longer the carbon storehouses they once were due to fires and drought. In the Amazon, we desperately need to stop extraction in these forests and create new deals for debt forgiveness so that countries are not drilling in one of the most important ecosystems on earth just to feed their debt. The dominant mitigation pathway compliant with the demands of the Paris Agreement contained in the IPCC's modeling scenarios rely on huge amounts of carbon capture and storage and the removal of vast quantities of CO2 using BECs. These scenarios have been repeatedly found to be wildly unrealistic, as well as dangerous for human needs in the environment if actually deployed. So given that BECs doesn't exist, and CCS capacity is orders of magnitude below requirements, the only conclusion possible is that the current IAM mitigation scenarios serve to downplay the global mitigation challenge. And in this way, we're throwing a lifeline to the fossil fuel industry, allowing it to essentially continue with business as usual. The really strange thing that I found is elsewhere in the IPCC's report, the IPCC's own findings underscore the technological feasibility of swiftly ending fossil fuel emissions, scaling up electrification and reducing energy demand. 
The IPCC notes the feasibility challenges associated with mitigation pathways are predominantly institutional and economic rather than technological and geophysical. The report then also contradicts itself by including the science that demonstrates the danger of relying on carbon capture and storage and large scale CDR, that it will prolong fossil fuels and defer emissions to the future. Working Group 3 explicitly states CCS can allow fossil fuels to be used longer. And also that CCS and CDR are unproven at scale, unavailable in the near term, and are uncertain benefit for the climate and pose significant risks to, of harm to humans and nature. So let me say this in plain English. We have a catastrophic group think in climate policy that is refusing to focus on reducing fossil fuel use and production, going so far as to call that unrealistic despite the plummeting costs of batteries and renewables, and the fact that we can replace most uses of fossil fuels today with existing technology. And instead, the whole system and our policy recommendations are being built on estimating wildly unrealistic carbon storage that doesn't exist. These same fallacies are now appearing in country and company planning as they define net zero. Commitments to net zero while increasing fossil fuel production by claiming abatement through carbon capture promises or the need for fossil fuel subsidies as long as they are efficient. Beware of those words in your policy making. Abated and unabated, efficient and inefficient. Over the last several years, they've started to appear in the top 26 text, in, in the COP26 text, in the new race to zero guidelines, in the documents for GFANS, the Global Banking Coalition, and in Canada, the US, Norway, the UK, Australia, and many other countries' plans to achieve net zero. What these terms masks is simply an expansion of fossil fuel production, a gaming of the system through tortured models and math that slow down mitigation and wind down of fossil fuel production and emissions. They just hold us back from the world that we want. Let's take a quick look at GFANS launched with much fanfare by Mark Carney at COP26. It now includes 108 banks that are committed to net zero. GFANS members are deeply involved in financing oil and gas expansion. In 2021, the 44 largest members of the Net Zero Banking Alliance provided $143.6 billion in lending and underwriting for the 75 companies doing the most to expand oil and gas. In October 2021, JP Morgan Chase, Mizuhu, and Unicredit joined the Net Zero Banking Alliance. The following month, they participated in a syndicate that underwrote the sale of 580 million in bombs for Gazprom. Of course, this has been heavily criticized. One would think if the banks are going to join an alliance, they would have to show that they have some plan to get to zero. The United Nations backed Race to Zero campaign is the body that issues criteria for setting those net zero targets. In September, during Climate Week, in response to several US banks threatening to leave GFANS because of restrictions they saw coming in the criteria, the race to zero criteria changed. This chart shows the previous text, which called for fossil fuel phase down and said that race to zero members should restrict the development of financing and facilitation of new fossil fuel assets. Now the new text notes that Unabated, unabated fossil fuel phase down, and again, unabated fossil fuels in several places in the text. In case this was not enough reassurance to the banks that they really didn't have to change anything once they signed onto a net zero pledge, GFANS issued a clarification last week telling the banks that they have a right to ignore any proposals that would require members to phase out the financing of fossil fuels. In the end, what is holding us back is not scientific evidence. It's not technology. It's not financing. It's power. It's power in the hands of a few incumbents who stand to benefit from the status quo. It was simpler back in the day when the fossil fuel industry would simply deny climate change, and we knew which side of the fence they were on. What we know now is that the big oil companies knew. 
They knew 30 years ago what we were facing. They knew about the science, they buried it, they denied it, and then they funded the denial machine. We know oil firms have spent millions on lobbying to hold back and weaken climate policies. The top five spent 200 million just in the five years after Paris. In Canada alone, research shows that the oil and gas industry had 11,000 meetings with government officials in a seven year period. That's roughly six meetings every workday for almost a decade. The industry claims it's committed to a transition, yet when you look at the capex of the industry, Big Oil only spent about 1% of their combined budget on renewable energy. It's also roughly 1% to 2% on average for each of the majors. In his excellent book, Regime of Destruction, Dr. William Carroll outlines the many corporate efforts to continue oil extraction and block climate policy by lobbying and engagement, biased information creation, media campaigns, strategic philanthropy, community engagement, astroturfing, creating of pseudo grassroots groups like Canada's Energy Citizens, and influencing public education, and of course, lawsuits. The fossil fuel industry is holding climate policy hostage. They've gone from denial to doubt to delusion. Having successfully convinced decision makers that we can invest and build more of what's killing us as long as we invest in technologies that are unproven and not working, instead of redirecting those funds to efficiency measures, electrification and renewable infrastructure that's already working and proven at scale. The excellent work of Influence Map over the last couple of years has given us the hard evidence and data to track this. In their most recent report, they do extensive analysis of the public communications of five super majors, Shell, BP, Total, Chevron, and Exxon. They find that they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars each year on a systemic strategy to portray themselves as positive and proactive on the climate emergency. This is found to be inconsistent with the company's plans for capital investment in the business. It's also found to be misaligned from the detailed policy engagement act activities of the companies and their industry associations on climate change. The research found detailed evidence of all of the super majors directly advocating for policies that encourage the development of new oil and gas. The research also found evidence of all of the majors having lobbied policymakers to dilute renewable energy focused policies through demanding the inclusion of fossil gas. Influence maps uh, tracking also indicates that none of the superpowers have lobbied in favor of methane emission reduction regulations since 2021, instead taking mixed or negative positions on the details of the specific regulations. This is despite the importance of methane mitigation being a key claim for the industry and top line support for the development of methane regulation. These companies have created social license by convincing us that they're part of the solution. And more than that, that continued dependence on oil and gas is necessary for jobs, for economic development, to keep the lights on, or more recently to turn the lights on in Africa. Well, they've had hundreds of years to turn the lights on in Africa, and despite massive fossil fuel projects that have poisoned people and rivers across many countries, millions still live in energy poverty, while the industry is posting record profits. Even in my own country, Canada, the data shows, while production steadily increases, royalties have plummeted, jobs are steadily decreasing, subsidies have risen to the billions, and the toxic liabilities left behind leave taxpayers with a massive cleanup price tag. I know from years work, trying to work with the oil industry that there are a lot of good, smart people working in the industry. We need to not confuse our relationships and respect for those people and support for workers in need of a plan and a transition from support and engagement with the fossil fuel companies themselves who are distorting climate policy and politics. These companies are just not going to design their own demise. They should not be in net zero commissions and consultations. They should not be at the table to design the policies that should be managing the wind down of the products they sell. And they certainly should not be the largest contingent at the global climate negotiations as they were at last year's COP26. 
We need to plan for a managed decline of fossil fuel production that leaves no worker or their family behind. The fact is that this will be a managed transition or an unmanaged transition. An unmanaged transition will cost more, be more painful, and it will leave more people behind. So where do we go from here? We need new policies at a domestic level to stop the expansion of fossil fuel production and infrastructure and eliminate eliminating fossil fuel subsidies is critical. Along with, of course, increased ambition on efficiency and demand reduction measures, protection of existing forests and wetlands. We need to be planning for absolute emission and production decline involving the public in a massive scale up effort on electrification and renewable energy. I've chosen to focus my efforts now on the development of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty globally, because my work in Canada convinced me that it's going to be very difficult for any country to stop the expansion of fossil fuel production alone because every country wants to be the last barrel sold. This is a global problem and it requires global cooperation. If we're going to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, then we're gonna to need to create new bilateral and multilateral agreements to stop and wind down the expansion of fossil fuel production and emissions. Of course, this is something that as indigenous leaders and civil society groups have known for decades, we need to keep carbon in the ground. That's what the science has been telling us. But in some ways, what I discovered through my work is that these calls to keep carbon in the ground had nowhere to land because there weren't policy pathways for constraining the supply along with the demand. We need with urgency to create those policy pathways. We need to create a new norm that you cannot be a climate leader and grow the production of fossil fuels. The Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty is a growing group of lawyers and advocates and diplomats and researchers, scientists, and now, as of last month, governments from around the world our goals are to shift the global norm on fossil fuels, to provide a missing framework, to provide the missing framework and mechanisms for a multilateral agreement, to grow the global movement for a just energy transition centered on equity, to motivate cities and states and now countries to phase out coal, oil, and gas, to increase the transparency and accountability by developing research on fossil fuel expansion, Recently, the Carbon Tracker Initiative launched the Global Registry of Fossil Fuel Production and Reserves. This is the first global database that will have complete transparency on who's producing what and where. We've also been working on a global registry of supply side policies, tracking supply side policies at every level of government that will be released later this month. The treaty is based on three pillars, which is similar to nuclear non-proliferation. First, don't add to the problem and new exploration, a fair phase out, and then a just transition to fast track solutions. The provisions of the treaty are for countries to negotiate, but we are currently working with lawyers and diplomats from around the world to develop the, the principles that underlie a treaty. One of the critical principles is equity and international cooperation, because under all of our work is the theory of change that given the scale of the challenge and the urgency and the fact that many countries face capacity constraints, they can't undertake the transition on their own, there has to be international cooperation. And I think this chart really helps demonstrate the challenge because while there's no doubt that all fossil fuel producing countries face major challenges, if you look at countries like the US, Canada, and the UK on the left of the chart, not only do they have much more diversified economies, so they aren't dependent on oil reserves for their taxation and for the provision of government services, but they also have higher GDP per capita, which indicates a greater capacity to transition away from fossil fuels. Momentum towards the treaty is growing. We are only about 25 months old now. And we already have 1,750 civil society organizations from 105 countries who have joined the initiative. 101 Nobel laureates, including the Dalai Lama, have endorsed the call for the Fossil Fuel Treaty. Cities from around the world, 69 cities actually, have endorsed the call for a Fossil Fuel Treaty. 
Youth activists from around the world have joined the campaign. Most recently, faith groups from all over the world, including the Vatican, have endorsed the fossil fuel treaty. Last month, the World Health Organization and health organizations from around the world joined the call. Over 480 elected officials, parliamentarians from 68 countries, are calling for the three pillars of the treaty. And at Climate Week, just last month, Vanuatu became the first nation state to call for the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty on the floor of the UN. Yesterday, the European Parliament called for nation states to work on developing a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty in the resolution passed ahead of COP27. I'm often asked after speeches if I have hope. The bottom line is that if you are not terrified right now, if you're not angry right now, you're not paying attention. Humanity is hurtling towards a cliff and the world's wealthiest countries are still stepping on the gas, quite literally. Hope, hope is not something you have, it's something you create. Actions truly are the antidote to despair. Barbara Kingsolver once said that every day she gets up and she puts on hope like a sweater and decides what she's gonna do that day, that as a parent, hope is the only moral choice. This week in her really important essay in the New Statesman, Rob, Rebecca Solnit calls climate despair a luxury. Those facing, facing floods and fires can't afford to use hope and neither can we. I think what we need now more than hope is courage. Courage to propose the policies that prioritize ecosystem health, life and livelihoods. The courage to stand up to the influence of the fossil fuel industry the courage to say no to building more of the problem and yes to diversified renewable energy systems that wrest power away from the few and into the hands of the millions. The courage to stand up in any way we can. The courage to call out inaction and bad policy. The courage to stand up to block projects that take us in the wrong direction. And the courage to support those scientists who are now going to jail for protesting fossil fuel expansion, the courage to propose big, bold new solutions, because we can't afford more of the same. If there's anything I've learned about courage from standing with indigenous leaders from Canada to the US to Amazon who are blocking new oil and gas projects, the good thing about courage, well, courage is contagious. Thank you. Uh, wow, uh, what a what a great uh, a, a great keynote talk. Um, when uh, Matt, Sarah, and I first got together uh, to talk about what we were going to do at the conference, um, we agreed on two things. Uh, one was that the theme was going to be acceleration, um, and second that to have acceleration, we needed to have conversations between knowledge and especially knowledge conveyed in a very direct way. Um, and action. And that's why we came up uh, with Sephora as our keynote speaker. Um, and I think that she's uh, just, um, I just wanna thank her again for delivering that in such a, such a motivating way. So thank you again, Sephora. Um, so we have uh, a few minutes for Q and A, and I know that there's some people online too, and someone is keeping track of the on, Line. You, uh, okay, great. Um, but we also have two microphones. So if you could speak into the microphones and Sephora, if you can't hear, I'll try to repeat the question, but I'm hoping through the mics that you'll be able to hear the questions. So just raise your hands and the folks with the microphones can come around to you. Oh, I'm here too, okay. It's hard for me to see, okay. Maybe you can just say your name uh, before you ask the question. Sure, hi. Thank you very much for that wonderful keynote speech. 
My name is Norman Kennedy. I'm a fellow Canadian, although I work at the University of Dartmouth, in Switzerland now. Um, so as a fellow Canadian, I'm also very disappointed in the state of our country, right, where we built new pipelines, we declare ourselves as climate leaders, the hypotheses are self-evident that you uh, described today. You also said in your talk that fossil fuel companies shouldn't be at the table when we're designing new solutions and uh, pathways moving forward. Well, let's talk about Alberta, because Alberta is not just a province with a bunch of fossil fuel companies, it's also a province of people, and it's a province in a federation. So what does a solution for Canada look like when we have a province that is so heavily invested, one might even say trapped in a carbon industry? So does Alberta have a seat at the table in negotiating a solution for the country? And how do we navigate the complex interlinkages between the Albertan oil industry and the Albertan people as members of Canada? Okay, thank you. Did you, you caught that? I did. I did. It's a really great question. Thank you so much. Of course, Alberta has to have a seat at the table. I mean, we live in a democracy. Canada is a confederation. Alberta has to have a seat at the table for sure. Um, but I think that the federal government also needs to do everything it can to ensure the social good. And, and I don't think that's happening right now. I mean, I'm very excited to see that we're going to have an emissions cap on oil and gas. I'm worried, uh, again, that the industry has been at the table trying to design that emissions cap. Because look what happened to the carbon tax. 80% of the emissions from the big emitters from the oil and gas companies are not covered by our national economy-wide carbon tax because they gained the rule. We need to regulate the industry. And yes, Alberta has to be at the table, but we have to have less influence from the fossil fuel companies. Um, and I think that Canada needs to look at other constitutional powers that it has the, the ability to use, uh, for example, water, uh, climate tests applied to any new project being proposed. The, the federal government, for reasons that I don't really understand in Canada, no longer does a federal environmental review of in situ projects. And in situ are the majority of the new oil sands development. There are more tools in the toolbox of the federal government, but it takes political courage. And we do need to unite the country. But we're not going to do that if even progressive governments like Premier Horgan's in BC, Premier Notley when she was in Alberta, and Prime Minister Trudeau continue to invest in the narrative that the fossil fuel industry has created. So, so I mean, even Trudeau at one point was saying we need to phase out oil and gas early in his term, and then, and then, and then to, did an about face a month later and said no sane leader would leave you know money in the ground, and so we're playing into the narrative. We need to tell the truth. We need to tell people the truth, and we need to give them ways to engage. And I think if you gave Albertans a plan for how to ensure that all workers and their families would be taken care of, that there was a just transition, that we could all create a sense of common purpose and create new policies that support the development of an even stronger economy. Because I know, well, I have a lot of family who work in Alberta in the oil industry, and I have a lot of family and friends in other resource industries across this country, and they would love to not be in such boom and bust jobs that take them away from their family all the time. So I, I think it is about planning for um, economic diversification and um, competitiveness in a way that is uh, systematic and recognizes the need that we have to ramp down production and start, instead of pretending that we don't have to. Okay, thank you very much. I understand we have a question from the, from the chat. So Jenna, are you? Ah, I see this. What are the main reasons that governments are not regulating production? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I tried to get at them in some of my talk. I, I, I've, I've spent the last 12 years on this question. <laughs> and, and, I, and I really firmly believe that it's in, in part, it's because of the social norm around expansion and production being prosperity 
we've all grown up with that and we've all benefited from the fossil fuel era. And so that's a very difficult thing to shift, especially while there's so much money and people going into trying to maintain uh, that, that norm. Um, I think it is also one of the primary reasons is um, uh, it is, is private capital, but that's shifting because we, we know that the electrification and renewable energy system requires significant infrastructure that are public spends. Whereas you can get a private company coming in and proposing to build the pipelines. And the, though now we, we seem to be owning Trans Mountain Pipeline in Canada for $20 billion, which is a strange turn of events to keep that one alive. But the point is you see, you used to see a lot more private investment. And also in the, in the, in the countries that are current suppliers of major fossil fuel production, those countries, uh, uh, rely on that for export revenue. And so what the number, how much it contributes to GDP or jobs in most countries, uh, wealthy countries, that's overstated. That's a cultural thing, myth that we have, that we have to keep the oil industry in, in order to pave our roads and keep our hospitals open. Actually, the data doesn't support that. But, um, but replacing that export revenue and the private investment in the country is significant. These are significant challenges. And I think that's what holds it back. Um, but I think it's also uh, fears of, of the right using it as a tool. I mean, Trudeau just fought an election on carbon tax and, you know, won. And, and that was amazing. And um, really acknowledging our challenge of phasing down fossil fuels, I don't think we've really had anyone that has had the courage to do that yet. But the interesting thing is if you look deeply at the polling in most major economies and especially wealthy countries, people are already there. They, they know that we're gonna have to get off fossil fuels. They just want a plan that shows them how to do it. They know that climate change is here now and they're terrified, but they, they haven't translated that into a commitment for how they'll vote because they don't see a plan. So we need to create those plans and those new narratives. And, and, I, and I think that we need politicians who are willing to tell the truth about how scary the moment we're living in is and how important increased ambition is. Okay. Um, I, are there other hands? I, I, have, I have a question um, <laughs> myself, uh, but others, please do raise your hands if you have further questions. Okay, there's one over there. Uh, there's a couple there, great. Um, just while we're going to those folks, you talked a lot about uh, talking to CEOs, about talking to uh, officials and so on. I'm wondering, I'm very curious about what you say in return. So you do a lot of listening and trying to understand what's, what's happening uh, on, on, from those folks. But what do you say in return that you feel uh, gives you some leverage? or that you feel is persuasive um, when you're talking to groups or you're talking to companies that you're trying to change their mind or see ways forward, um, or even it, you know talks like this. I mean, you're talking to a very sympathetic audience here, um, but what are sort of points of leverage and persuasion that you think we could learn from um, in our own work or in talking to people who, who may not agree? You know what? Um... I was writing a speech once when my one of my sons was young and it was uh, I was very angry about something Prime Minister Harper had done big surprise there and and I and I was writing a um I was writing a speech and I was reading some of it out to my kids at dinner and my son who was seven at the time said to me mom you can't yell at a plant to grow and I said what and he said well I mean, you plant a seed and then you water it, but the plant itself has to grow itself. <laughs> and it was the most amazing conversation. It was like um, that old adage, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't. can't um, it, um, my experience in working in Alberta was that I, um, I needed to have the patience to get people talking about their own lived experience for them to be able to recognize the moment that we're living in. 
for us to, and then for us to try and build some sense of common purpose. I was working with the mayor on the on the OSN's advisory committee who our first dinner together, she said, I know you're going to try and get me to believe in climate change and that it has something to do with those pipelines you're always blockading, but I'm not going to believe it. And I said, okay, shall we order? You know, <laughs> and 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 then I, I started asking her, well, so what do you do when you're not appointed to things like this? And she talked about she's a farmer and I said, have you noticed any changes in the last decade or so in your farming, like in your, you know, with the water or, or, or the temperature? And then she just went, oh, oh my God, yeah, our, 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 our growing seasons are totally different. And, da, 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 da. and she just started talking about her own lived experience of climate change. And then she stopped herself. And then she said, are you saying that's because of climate change? And climate change is because of fossil fuels? And it was the most, and I said, yes. And I, you know, and I think you just said it. And she said, can you send me anything about agriculture and climate change? And I was like, oh, sure. So I started sending her things and, and we developed this conversation. So I guess what I would say is you need to help people come to terms with it. Everyone's going to have their climate reckoning in a different way. And they have lived experience. You need to try and find common ground. You need to not deny people's lived experience. And we in the environmental movement have to stop pretending like this transition is going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. And, 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 it, and, and I think it's really, really important that we recognize that, we recognize the hardship, and that we uh, try and create proposals that create common purpose. Uh, you know, that's, yeah. And, and with the CEOs, um, the, that's a whole different um, you know, in a lot of ways with the CEOs, what I just had to do is point out what was beneficial to them. And with those CEOs, for example, a, a, a carbon tax, and some of them really thought Alberta having a strong climate plan and starting to get a good climate reputation was good for them, because then maybe they could sell their oil a little while longer. Um, and they they could weather the price of the carbon tax, um, because they are already making some, you know, such high profits. But where push came to shove on our ability to reach consensus-based recommendations was on any constraints to production levels. They'll, they'll, they'll support constraints to emission levels they, and, and even a carbon price, but they, they can't support constraints to production levels because their salaries depend on it. So do their bonuses, so does the structure of their companies. So that's where we just couldn't find co any common ground. Okay, thank you. Um... We only have time for one more question. Um, so I know there were, okay, the person with the microphone, great. And if you could keep it succinct, that would be terrific. Um, I have a student and uh, a master's student and she said, no, really, that doesn't apply to me. And I was saying, no, I can't. I don't know if I can refer to myself. I'll, I'll repeat, I'll try to repeat the question if you could just keep it brief. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so the question was, um, the, the, the questioner has, has students, um, they're from a kind of biophysical science uh, perspective, um, and the student was saying the issue is really about adaptation and, and equity. Um, so how do, you, um, how do you convey to people who are coming at it from this very sort of, you know, scientific, perhaps technocratic, although a technocratic perspective, to switch their lens um, to think more about the equity uh, equity side. Sorry, and the student was saying that it, this is an issue more of adaptation than it is of equity? Uh, no, sorry, more like adaptation and equity as opposed to just thinking about it as, you know, as you were talking about as an emissions problem, as kind of a, a, a physical or biophysical problem to be solved. Does that make sense? So bringing in the equity lens right. for people who don't, aren't used to thinking in that way. 
Well, I, I, I think, I, I think part, part of it is, um, uh, you know, uh, is the data on um, the fact that, that it's 70 companies and very few countries that have, have put the majority of the emissions into our atmosphere today. I find that it uh, um, is very successful to talk about emissions being trapped in the atmosphere. You know, we can negotiate climate policy all we want, but the atmosphere doesn't negotiate. It's there's, when they get up there, they get stuck. So how much is stuck and who put it there? And, and so if, 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 if these countries have created the problem, then these other countries are having the worst impacts. That's why I said at the beginning of my speech, that's not aid, that's not charity, that's reparations. Like that, that is what, that is equity. That's the responsibility there at a, at a local level. Um, uh, I think that it is absolutely critical to talk about equity and justice and the development of our policies in order to make them work. If we just make the rich richer and the poor poorer, then we will have um, an overloaded emergency and health system. That's the bottom line. If you have heat waves and poor people have no air conditioning, no heat pumps, nowhere to go, and we don't have that infrastructure, then that's a problem. There's more deaths, there's more problems. And these are issues which we are now gonna be facing every day. So it is it, it will cost us less to take action now, so we don't have to do as much adaptation, and it will cost us less, and there are many studies on this, to be able to include equity and adaptation um, now into the development of, uh, of our policies. I think, um, I think it also is important to get personal with people, that people need to um, understand that every ton of carbon today that we are able to save from going into the atmosphere will save lives. That's the situation we're in now. And we can, and scientists have calculated bodies per barrel. We, we know exactly what's happening. And we know that, and that's also, I think, a way to keep people who are feeling despair moving. And I think that's what Rebecca Solnit tries to do in that piece in the new statement is, is to say that every action we take today uh, has an impact. On, on people's lives. On, and, and so even if, as some scientists are saying, we no longer have a hope of staying below 1.5 degrees, every ton of carbon that we save from going into the atmosphere today will save lives. And, and, and I think um, that's important. But overall, all of the, a lot of these questions have been around how to convince people or how to talk to your students. And I think, um, Really, the most important thing that I can tell you is that all of the research shows that it isn't about the facts, that it isn't about education even. It's about motivation. People need to see that there's an opportunity for change and that, there's, that there is an ability for change. It's why I start with the good trends and talk about what's already happening, that, that we have the technology and the finance today. People need to see an opportunity for change. Um, and um, they need to be motivated. There's a saying in social movement theory, it's not about education, it's about motivation. They're motivated by an opportunity to change and they're motivated by people they trust. And that gets back to that amazing work of Jonathan Haidt and others who, who have looked at this concept of tribes. And, and that's why when I designed the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, I designed it first in going to the scientists, the Nobel laureates, the Vatican, the World Health Organization. Because when people see someone or something they care about or trust saying this thing, then they, then they um, will believe it more. Because that's how we sort information as humans. Okay, let me thank uh, Sephora again um, for a, a very motivating speech um, and, and, and Q&A. And I know there were more questions, um, but the good news is, is that this is the beginning of our conference and there'll be lots of time to continue these conversations. Uh, so thank you again, Sephora. Um, we really appreciate it. And it was just uh, wonderful to hear from you. Thank you. I'd, I'd now like to, um, to call up uh, Michelle Betzel.
there she is, right, right in front. Um, Michelle is going to uh, present the Orrin Young Prize. Um, Michelle, I'll give it over to you. All right, thank you, Stephen. That's a hard act to follow, and I'm also where I'm standing between you and the reception, so um, I will I will do my best. Um, I'm here as a member of the Orrin Young Prize Committee, so, um, in stepping in for Katerina Reitig, who is the chair of the committee, who um, wasn't able to be here. Um, the Orrin Young Prize is something that we've established in the the ESG community to honor Orrin Young, who not only was the the chair of the International Human Dimensions Program, the predecessor to their system governance project. Um, it was really um, been an important intellectual influence for many of us and a mentor for many of us. Um, those of us sort of, I guess, in, in my generation of, um, of early career scholars, um, he was sort of one of the few senior people that was around to, to support us and really um, help us shape our own ideas. And so um, this is the committee that reviewed the, um, the papers that were submitted for this year's prize. And um, our winner this year is Naomi Laurence from the Geneva Graduate Institute. Uh -oh. And I don't know if, if Noemi is online, but I um, hope that she is. And if you know her, maybe send her a, a tweet or an email um, to congratulate her. So the reviewers for this paper, um, her paper was on institutional adaptation in slow motion, zooming in on desertification governance. And the reviewers um, comments were that this is a very strong paper that provides an innovative approach to addressing important questions about institutional adapt adaptation, which is seen as critically important in governance for the Anthropocene and looks at this in the context of the UN Desertification Convention. It has great empirical material, addresses an important thorough, well understudied area of global environmental politics. It contains well executed research and is well written. Um, and hopefully if our technology works, We have a video from Oren for the laudation. Fingers crossed. I'm delighted this opportunity to say a few words about this year's winner of the Young Prize. In her paper on institutional adaptation in slow motion, Naomi Lawrence has a significant contribution to our understanding of institutional dynamics. Many have written about the formation of international issues and about their effectiveness in addressing problems. But these issues are not static, they change over time. So we need to know much more about the determinants and consequences of these institutional changes. Noreen Hachiman's idea of policy streams and exploring the role of design entrepreneurs really explains what substantive and procedural changes in the, the desertification regime. Going forward, this leaves us with several sets of intriguing questions. First, what are the determinants of institutional adaptations? Are there any necessary conditions for adaptation to occur? Or can we identify several combinations of sufficient conditions that may allow for adaptation specific situations? Second, what is the relationship between design and development and problem solving? 
to design and training institutions to improve the effectiveness of regimes. So these design changes make it more possible to solve the problems that make the creation of regime potential. Third, are the findings generalizable? Two international environmental regime concerts and homogeneous genetic cases when it comes to institutional genetics, or do we need to identify several subsets of cases in our effort to design to explain institutional genetics? In short, this paper does what any of the papers should do. It provides insights itself, and it opens up a new line of insight for those who want to follow up in this important stream of analysis. So I congratulate Naomi on an excellent contribution. All right. Well, we've come to the end of the opening plenary here, uh, but before we head to the reception, and, and really Michelle was standing in between me and then you and getting to the reception, we have a number of thank yous though, and this is this is important. And so we wanna make sure that we, we do it right, and then we'll go uh, toast to the opening of the ESG. So first I wanna thank the organizing team and volunteers. We usually do this at the end of the conference and we will again, don't worry, we will hold to that tradition. But this has been a challenging year to organize a conference for a number of foreseen and some unforeseen reasons. And I wanna make sure that we acknowledge upfront the work of those that have made the coming, this conference that we're about to embark on and just started today possible. So just hold your applause for a second. But Peter Aiken, our conference manager has been putting this all together. Jane and Lisa, who you were already introduced to, have made it all work from the IPO. Uh, Jenna Phillips and Devin Jones, our program coordinators and EF ECR coordinators, really have put together, help us put together a great program and a great ECR, um, great ECR events. Our conference assistants, Kaylin and Bradley and Sajil, really keeping us on track. Staff at the Monk School and the finance office, especially Stella Dong, and the whole range of volunteers, look for the orange badges, who will be getting you around and organized this weekend. And so as we get started on this conference, let's give them a welcome for getting this set off in the right way. We also have a number of sponsors to thank. ESG is not a membership organization. So putting on a conference like this requires the pooling of community resources to some extent. We've been fortunate to be well supported by a number of institutions in pulling this year's conference together. And so they're all up here, but I will read them off. Our host, University of Toronto, and that includes the Environmental Governance Lab here at the university, the University School of the Environment, the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, and the Vice President for uh, International's Office. University of Waterloo is the co-host for this or for this conference, and especially the Interdisciplinary Center on Climate Change and the Transform Project. We have a number of co-hosts, uh, basically sponsor or that have sponsored semi plenaries and really made this conference work. Um, make sure you attend semi plenaries. There were two today. There will be two tomorrow as well. Um, Science Po and uh, the Earth Politics Institute, uh, the Autonomous University of Mexico the University of Sussex, and the Transition Accelerator out of uh, Carleton University. Also, Utrecht University, the home to the ESG IPO, is always a great supporter of the conference, and that's no, uh, no difference this year. We also have a couple of other non-institutional important sponsors that make various pieces of this run, and I want to make sure they're acknowledged. Um, so the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada provided a generous grant, a connections grant, to help this to, to really make a lot of this work, as well as MIT Press and the Earth Systems Governance Journal. And so let's give a round of applause to our sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> 